good sound to hear. It's not a bad thing. Uh, <clears throat> All right, well, welcome, church family, to week five of our Wise Church Sermon Series. In this sermon series, we are learning how we can collectively bring glory to God as his body and as we function as his church body. And that's what he wants us to do in the good days, in the bad days, in all the days he has for us. He wants us to the function as a glorious church. And the church is all of God's children uh, relating to one another as the collective body of Christ. And remember, we've been saying that Jesus doesn't want just any kind of church. Just any kind of church will not do. Just any kind of church is not what he died for. He died that we would be a glorious church. That we would be a church that represents him in everything that we do. And our theme verse for this uh, sermon series comes from Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 27. And it says this, Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. God is making us into, Jesus is making us into a glorious church. Uh, Christ's glorious church isn't just a showpiece to, to look at and admire. Uh, I grew up going to car shows and, and seeing car shows uh, happen and participating. And, and, and there are some cars that people put together that are, are we call them trailer queens, right? They, they are perfect. They are, are well put together, well made, polished, buffed. They looked amazing at the car show but they're really just not functional. They, they don't get driven, they don't get used, they are trailer queens. The church is not a trailer queen. It is not something to be looked at and admired and just think, oh, look how beautiful and clean they are. They're, the church is, is, is to be a functional church. We always tip our hats with a little bit more respect, us mechanics do, to the guys who drove their cars to the, to the car shows. Why? Because you're putting it all on the line driving it to the car show. You're driving around with everybody else and you're showing that your car still functions fully and that you trust your work to drive it there and you trust your driving ability to keep it away from all the crazies, right, that are going to wreck into you. The church is not a trailer queen. The church is to be out there in the world showing people that Jesus works in our lives. And yes, we may get bumped into. Yes, we may have some rough roads to go to, but guess what? Our faith works. Our Jesus works in the real world. And he really brings healing and help to our lives. And that's what he wants us to be out there doing as his body, the church. We are to be a functioning body of Christ. And we have been entrusted to take his work to the world, to, to continue that work. The church has been gifted a mission to work at passionately until Jesus comes again. And that specific mission we have entrusted to us to complete, we hear Jesus gift it to us specifically in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And we often refer to this as the Great Commission. You're familiar with it, but I want to remind you of it again today. Hear Jesus' words to his church this morning. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, park it in the pew on Sunday morning and wear your nicest clothes and brush your teeth for once that week. No, it's not what he says, is it? He says, get out in the world. Go find the people who don't know me yet who need to know that there is a Savior. Jesus says this, there go, Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
My friends, the Lord has entrusted to us his church, his work, to continue this mission in the world. But not only has he given us this job to do, he has given us the power to carry it out. It isn't something that we do in our own power or in our own effort. It is something that he empowers us to do. He has gifted the church his people with the Holy Spirit to be empowered to fulfill this mission he has entrusted to us. We hear the words of Jesus again speaking about this empowering that he will give us. In Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus has given us a mission to complete. Jesus has given us the power in which to complete that mission of being his witnesses, of being disciple makers, of being people who go out into the world and tell them the truth of who Jesus is. Jesus, is, Jesus expects the church to continue to be his witnesses to the world, that salvation has come. And real people like us, just normal people, can be saved. Lives can be transformed, and we show them that we, can, we no longer have to live in the bondage and hopelessness of sin, but we can be forgiven, and we can live new lives to the glory of God, both now and for eternity. And Jesus gave his life to make that salvation message a reality for us. And he was resurrected to show that his sacrifice was acceptable and sufficient for all who would believe. That is a great message to share with whoever we come across. Look, God's salvation is for you too, not just for me, but for you as well. And that is a great and, and, and passionate thing that we need to share with other people. Jesus wants everyone to have the opportunity to make the choice to turn and receive his free gift of salvation that is waiting for them. And he wants them to experience the life that God has waiting for for them as well. I hope you continue to pick up on the words for. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago? Everybody says that God wants something for, from you. But we see in Scripture and throughout everything, yes, he does expect us to respond to the things he has for us. Jesus has uh, salvation for everyone who will believe. Jesus has a great new life for everyone who will put their, their faith and trust in him. As more people come to salvation through Jesus Christ, not only are their lives changed, and not only is that how the church is supposed to grow, which is how... Uh, um, the church is, grows is by reaching out to more people and saying, we don't want to bring people from other churches. We want to share the good news with new people who have never heard that they need salvation and that salvation has come for them. That's how the church grows. That's how their lives are changed. And as that happens, more and more glory is brought to God the Father. As more and more people are saved, more glory is brought to the Father. That's what we are to be about doing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 13 through 15. We read this, but we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, we believed in God, so I spoke. I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God raised uh, the Lord Jesus will also raise us with him and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. For your benefit. As the, and as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. It's a double blessing. We get a chance to receive the, the blessings that the Lord has for us. It's for our benefits that we're saved. But as we're saved, and, and I'm not just talking about us, but as more and more and more people are saved, more glory is brought to God. And that is pleasing to him beyond all imagination. 
if we understand that Jesus wants his Father to receive more and more glory through the lives that are saved and through the disciples that are made, we begin to grasp the importance of the mission that Jesus has entrusted to us and empowered us to complete. Do you understand it? Do you grasp it? The Lord has entrusted us with this mission. He has empowered us with this mission. And when we complete this mission, not only do we benefit, but God's glory is gained greater and greater and greater. This mission has been entrusted to the church. This mission that has been entrusted to the church is not optional. It is essential, both for ourselves and for God's glory. This is an essential thing that the church must be doing. Do you understand what the church is to be doing? No one understands. I hope that you understand what the church is to be doing. Because we need to feel the weight of the responsibility that has been entrusted to us. We need to feel the weight of what, the, what our responsibility is to the Lord Jesus Christ as he has entrusted this work to us. Because I wonder how he would feel if the church forgot the importance of the mission that had been entrusted to them. What would happen to a church that would forget the mission that they had been assigned and the reason for which they were to be carrying it out? Well, sadly, we don't have to wonder what Jesus would think about a church about that because it happens to churches all the time. They forget the importance of the mission that has been assigned to them and they forget that they were entrusted to carry out the ministry that Jesus had given them to do and that he had empowered them to do. And they forget, above all, why they were even doing it in the first place, to bring glory to God. In fact, the very last letter from Jesus to the seven churches recorded in the book of uh, Revelation addresses a church who forgot its mission. They forgot what Jesus had entrusted them to do. They forgot what Jesus had empowered them to do. And they forgot why they were even doing it in the first place. This letter is found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 through 22. And it, and it addresses the church in Laodicea. Listen to Jesus' words to this church, and then I'll explain more about this church and how we can avoid the mistakes that they made. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 and following says this. Write this letter to the church of, uh, to the angel of the church of Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you, are, since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me, so you, will not be, uh, so you will not be shamed by your nakedness, and ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. I correct and disciple everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to what the Spirit must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. This is a tough letter. There is no praise in this letter for this church. 
This is a message, though, that has been given in love to correct an error that this church has succumbed to and to call them back to the mission that they have been entrusted to fulfill. And the letter starts out, as all the letters do, with Jesus Christ identifying himself as the sender. But the way in which Jesus identifies himself in this letter is very, very telling of what this church had failed to do. In verse 14b, it says, Jesus says this, this is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. Jesus identifies himself as the model witness for God. He is the faithful and true witness, the model the church should have followed but did not. Jesus says, I am the faithful and true witness. Next, as in all the letters, we hear Jesus again let us know that he is intimately involved in the life of this church. In verse 15, we hear Jesus say, I know all the things you do. Remember, he has said that to every church that we have looked at, and he speaks that over us today as well. I know everything you do. Jesus knows all about this church and exactly how they are failing to live out the mission that he has entrusted to them. Jesus doesn't mince words. He speaks hard truth in love to them. Listen to him speak verse 15 again. I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The word spit you or the phrase spit you out of my mouth in that version is actually the word for vomit. I will vomit you out of my mouth. I will be violently ill or I am violently ill when I look at you. Um, the church makes Jesus sick to the point of vomiting. You ever been that sick when you just see something that just churns your stomach and you, your body just reacts? It's incontrollable. Jesus says, when I look at your church, Laodicea, I get physically ill. And I want to vomit because of the way that you are. What would cause such a gut-wrenching reaction from Jesus? And it's this. He cannot stomach the indifference that he sees in his church. He can't stomach it at all. It churns his, tum his stomach to the point of vomiting. They have become indifferent to him and to their mission. They are failing to be faithful and true witnesses because they have settled into self, the self-satisfaction of existing in the world and, and not making any waves, but let's just be comfortable. Let's all just get along and, and let's just find sufficiency in and of ourselves. Listen to all the I statements that Jesus says about them in verse 17. Listen to all these I statements. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And then Jesus says, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. These words from Jesus let us know yet again that he knows all these people are doing and the situation that they are living in and the way that they're living out their faith in him. Their I statements reveal that they have become self-focused. However, the mission that had been entrusted to them was one that has a focus on God and others and not self. But they have turned and focused on their own self and their own comfort. To help us understand more of what Jesus knows about the setting of this church, let me tell you a little about the city of Laodicea and the church located there. 
because Jesus truly does know exactly what he's saying to them, and they hear him clearly exactly what he is calling them to do and how to respond. Laodicea was the wealthiest of the seven cities that, that uh, where the seven churches that Jesus wrote to were located. They were the wealthiest of the seven. It is no, they were known as the banking industry of the, reason, of the region. They uh, were on the, the trade routes, both north and south and east and west, and so they were able to, to make money hand over fist because of where they were located. They had an industry of producing black wool that they sold, and they had a medical school there that produced eye salve uh, and ointment for the eyes to, to treat that. The city also had a very major flaw in that it had no fresh water source within the city. So they had to bring water from a hot spring that was quite a distance outside of the city. By the time the water arrived into the city via an, an aqueduct, it was lukewarm. And because of it being a hot spring and the changes of that throughout the seasons, it would at times be filled with minerals. And so by the time it reached the city, not only was it lukewarm, but it was full of minerals that made people sick if they would drink the water. This city was so affluent and so self-sufficient that when it was destroyed by an earthquake in 60 AD, they were, re- they were able to rebuild the entire city and probably their church by themselves. And they refused any outside help from Rome. Pay attention to that. Sadly, the church in Laodicea has become comfortable in their surroundings and they seem to display the self-sufficient nature of their city. So self-sufficient and worldly sufficient were they that they pushed Jesus out of the church. They were good to go. They had everything they needed. They didn't need anything else, including Jesus. And they push him right out the church. We know that they've pushed Jesus out of the church because look at where Jesus says He is standing as he is addressing the church. Look at verse 20. Jesus says this, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, open the door. I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Jesus is outside the church. He's outside his church not just a church, this is one of his churches. This is the body of Christ. And they've pushed him outside. No, Jesus, we're comfortable in here. We're good to go. We don't need anything, including you. So Jesus has been pushed outside the church. Jesus is knocking on the door to get back in. Jesus says, if anybody in there, I I know you're in there. If anybody in there can hear my voice, open the door and let me in. I want to come back in to my church, but I'm not going to kick the door down. I'll stand here and knock, and I'll call to you. But you have to hear my voice. You have to respond. You have to get up and you have to open the door and you have to invite me in. Jesus isn't content to let this church continue to be lukewarm and self-sufficient. They must make a decision to include him again and get back to work on doing the mission that he had entrusted them to do. Jesus knows that they must include him, the faithful and true witness, if they are ever to have any hope of being a faithful and true witness themselves. They cannot be faithful and true witnesses if they exclude Jesus from the church. They know not who they speak of then. He's not among them. He's not with them. They must include Jesus, the faithful and true witnesses. All churches, including our church, must heed this warning from Jesus and do all that we can to remain faithful and true to become or to remain faithful and true witnesses carrying out the mission that Jesus entrusted to us here's three ways that we 
can continue to be faithful and true witnesses while completing the mission that we have been entrusted with. The first one is this. We must realize that Jesus corrects and disciplines his church out of love. This is a tough letter from Jesus, but it's tough love. And Jesus says, I discipline those that I love. I, I, I could just let you go on your way, but I'm not willing to do that. I love you enough to discipline you. I love you enough that I want you to let me back in, and I want you to be a part of the glorious church again. Look at verse 19 where Jesus says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Though these words of correction make us wince, we must realize that Jesus and the church are in a loving relationship. Do you remember that? That's the relationship that we're in. It's a loving relationship. This isn't, uh, this isn't a business deal or a company strategy that they were supposed to be carrying out as a mission to the world. They were supposed to be demonstrating the relationship, the loving relationship between themselves and the Lord. That was the mission that was entrusted to them. And it's a relationship that Jesus helped build and was the result of his love displayed for them on the cross. Jesus' love helped build that relationship. His love is the foundation of that relationship. And if that relationship is to continue, he, we must understand that all that he does for us, including the correction that he brings us, is done out of love. The mission that was entrusted to us was a message and an invitation to a loving relationship with Jesus Christ, right? Isn't that the mission that we're supposed to be sharing with other people? But if we don't have it ourselves, we have nothing to share but empty words and rhetoric. We don't have a loving relationship to say, look at how he's changed my life. Look at how I've responded. Look at how he's blessing my life. Look at how I hope in him, even in the days of brokenness and despair. Friends, we must maintain the love that Christ has for us in our lives. The church, uh, all the church has to do is to be faithful, to live in the loving relationship that Jesus gives us, and to speak about it truthfully to others. We don't have to, uh, we don't have to make up anything. We just have to live faithfully in the relationship he gives us and speak truthfully about it. That's what it is to be a witness. To say, you know what? Let me tell you about Jesus, who I'm in relationship with. And let me tell you how he helps me all the time. That's why Jesus is so sick about the way that this church is treating him and his mission. They were ultimately rejecting his love. And it nauseates him. And it makes him sick after all the love he has poured out on them. But guess what? Amazingly, Jesus continues to enact love towards this church by lovingly correcting them, right? Jesus' loving correction tells them, be diligent and turn from your indifference. Be diligent means be faithful. Be faithful. And turn from not caring about what you're supposed to be doing. Our world is sick with indifference today. Jesus says, turn from your indifference. Realize what has been given to you. Realize that you have been not only saved yourself, not only empowered yourself, but you've been entrusted with the mission to go and save uh, and, and empower others to live, to bring glory to God. So his loving correction is to turn from your indifference and be diligent, be faithful once again. If we're going to turn from our difference and be faithful and true witnesses, we must keep Jesus in the church. We must keep Jesus in the church. You would think that that doesn't need to be said, right? But it does. And Jesus himself says, I'm outside. You didn't even miss me. You're too busy watching TV and lounging around and patting yourself on the back. You didn't even realize I was gone. I'm outside knocking. Is anybody in there listening? We should never 
Leave Christ outside of the church. It shouldn't even have to be said, but Jesus has to say it to the church in Laodicea, and he has to remind all of us as well that Jesus needs to remain in the church. Jesus said, if you hear my voice, open the door. I will come in. That's an amazing offer once he's been pushed out. How many of you want to go back to a restaurant you've been excused from? Or someone's house that you've been thrown out of? Or a church that you didn't feel welcome in? Do you want to go back? No. In love, Jesus is willing to go back in and set things right with this church because he wants for them to be a glorious church. But there is no way to do that unless Jesus remains in the church. That is so important that we must understand that. Jesus is knocking and calling, and he is willing to come back in, but we must listen for his voice, and we must respond to his voice, and we must constantly and willingly invite him back in and invite him to stay here. We do that in many ways in this church. Some of those ways are this. Uh, we, we meet every Sunday morning. While, while some of you are in Sunday school and some of you are still at home prepping, we have a prayer team that meets upstairs. And we pray every Sunday morning, God, would you come and be here? And we pray over the needs of the church and we ask God and we acknowledge that he is there and he is working with us. We open the service every Sunday morning with an invitation for him to come and be here. There's a fancy name for it, right? What is it? Invocation, right? It's the invocation. It's the invitation and the acknowledgement. God, come. God, come. We need you here. We're your people gathered. Come. And not only do we call and we acknowledge that he's here, God, you're here. And we need you here. We want you here. We do those things, inviting him, continuing to invite him to come. We pray before and at the close of nearly all of our church meetings. Not, not, I'm not talking Sunday, Sunday mornings. I'm talking business meetings that we have, Bible studies that we have. We try, why do you got to do that? Isn't he already there? Yeah, but we want to remind ourselves that we want him here. And we want, him, we want to invite him into every one of those meetings and Bible studies and all that happens We have to continue to keep Jesus in the church, and we do that in those ways and so many more. My friends, the world is doing all that it can to keep Jesus out of everything, and we're going to hear more about that next week. But the church needs to do all it can to keep Jesus in the church. We need to do all we can to keep Jesus in the church, and we need to keep him in, not because he's trying to get out, right? Lock the doors. Jesus is trying to get out again, right? No, he's not trying to get out. He wants to be in here with us, and we need to desire, desire desperately that he would be here with us because we realize without him, we have no possible way of being faithful and true witnesses, and we have no possible way to be empowered to go out and do what we've been called and equipped to do if he's not in the church. If he's not here, we are lost and powerless. And we are an inept church. And we make Jesus sick if he isn't here with us. And let me just whisper another secret to you. We are sick if we think that we're a church without Jesus. We're naked, we're blind, we're deaf, and we're ill to the point of eternal death if we disregard Jesus from the church. We must keep Jesus in the church. He desires to be here. We have to desire that he be here too and that we come to meet him and continue to carry out his call in our lives. To continue to be faithful and true witnesses, the third thing that we must do is this. We must remain dependent on Jesus to fulfill his mission. We need to be dependent on him. Jesus wants us to know that we aren't self-sufficient. That is a lie of the world. We want to raise our kids to be self-sufficient. Well, good, you're raising them to fail. That's exactly what the world wants you to do, and that's exactly what the world tells you to do. Jesus says, I want you to learn to be dependent. 
children on me. We are to learn to be dependent. Jesus wants us to know that we're not self-sufficient and that we aren't, uh, and if we depend on the hollow offerings of the world, we will be the fool at the end of the day and not the one who is wise. Jesus makes the point that this church was gladly putting their trust into things that their society was offering to them, and it left them fooled by the temporary satisfaction that they had, but it left them lacking for eternity. Jesus says this in verse 17 again. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need anything. And then Jesus says, and you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You've been fooled by the glamour of the world, the hollowness of what they offered you. And it was comfortable and it was complacent and it was fun. But it leaves you broken and lacking for eternity. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says, trust in my love. Jesus wants him to be Jesus wants him to willingly be dependent on him. So that's why he says this in verse 18. So I advise you to buy gold from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich and buy white garments from me so that you will not be ashamed so you will not be shamed by your nakedness and an ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see is Jesus an Amway salesman or an Avon salesman selling gold and garment and isav is that what he's doing no not at all it's a metaphor for what they have been doing they've been trusting and and buying wholeheartedly all that the world was selling them Black, or they were famous for black cloth, black wool in that town. Jesus says, you, you gladly buy those and strut around in them. You should have been buying white garments of purity from me that my children get when they learn to trust in me. You, you think you're, you see all the world as it is. You think you're so wide-eyed that, that you are so self-sufficient. Jesus says, you're blind. You need eye salve. Spiritual eye staff so you can see how lost you really are. And so you can look around and see that I'm not even in the church. Jesus says, buy gold for me. He's not selling gold. He says, you've learned to depend on all the things of the world. All that they have offered you. You willingly gave yourself to them. Jesus says, why wouldn't you just come and trust me? Buy gold that's purified. Buy eternity that's purified by me, and he's not selling it, he's giving it. But he's making the point that he knows them well, and he's speaking right to their needs of where they are. Jesus wants them to wisely choose to depend on him for their needs and for the satisfaction that lasts eternally. When, and, and that only comes when we learn to be wise, faithful, and true witnesses for him. But Jesus wants us desperately for this church and for all churches. As with all the letters, Jesus includes a promised blessing for those who will respond to his message of loving correction in a positive way. Once again there, Jesus has something for us. If you'll respond to my loving correction, I have something for you. For those who remain faithful and true, Jesus says this in verse 21, for those who are victorious uh, will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. I don't have time to explain all that that means today, but it means in part this, that we will be welcomed into the loving presence of the Lord and that we will enjoy an ongoing loving relationship with him forever. Exactly what we were supposed to be witnessing to and about the whole time. Jesus says, that's what's waiting for you. You have a loving, uh, eternal relationship, living in my presence and enjoying all that I have to offer you. That's why, uh, sorry, <clears throat> that's something that we don't want to miss out on, is it? 
And it's something that we shouldn't want anyone else to miss out on either. That's why Jesus gave us the mission to go and make disciples and to tell others. That's why he gave us, empowered us to go and to carry that out. That's why he says, man, do you realize what you're doing? When you go and do that, you bring more and more glory to my Father. And you are going to be blessed in the end for having done that, for having been a faithful and true witness. There are great and awesome blessings for you. I want you to be that type of glorious church. I'm calling you back to doing that. Revelations 3, 22, Jesus ends his letter saying this, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. My friends, I hope that you have listened to Jesus today. I hope the Spirit has applied his words to and over us today. My friends, we are his church. and We are not to be comfortable and complacent with our own satisfaction. We are to be a church that's on a mission, that has been empowered to reach others for the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they might be saved, that the glory of the Father might increase, and that we might receive the eternal reward that we have waiting for us as well. My friends, we should be a glorious church telling people everywhere all about Christ's love. Did you know there is no time like the present to do that? This pandemic, this illness, whatever you want to call it, has given us every opportunity to say, church, don't wait. Church, get out of your easy chair. Church, get to telling other people about me. This needs to happen. And guess what, church, as we said earlier, some of you are going to model what it's like to die victoriously. Victoriously faithful to me to the end. Faithful and true witnesses. I read that passage over... um, at the, at the graveside over most uh, people who have passed. As for me, my life has been poured out. I have been faithful. I have finished the race. I have been faithful. And now the crown of righteousness is mine. But not only for me, but for all who would trust in Jesus Christ. Friends, some of us will die. All of us will die. But are you going to die as a faithful and true witness to Jesus Christ? We need to be ready as a church to give the message to live the life and to die the death if necessary, being faithful and true witnesses to the very end and then receiving the crown of righteousness that has been promised to us. This is a glorious opportunity. We need not be afraid. We need to step into that with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, help me to be a faithful and true witness for you. Would you stand as we close in prayer today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us, for your love that would call us to correction, for your love that would call us to account, to remember once again what we have been saved for, what we have been entrusted to do as your church, as we live and function and thrive in this world. We are to be making disciples. We are to be witnesses that are faithful and true, telling about salvation through Jesus Christ and living that out, come rain or shine or death or promotion or whatever. Father, we are to be your church, proclaiming the truth of who you are, Father, help us to be that church that you are calling us to be. Help us to proclaim uh, as faithful and true witnesses the power that comes in salvation, the power that comes through the Holy Spirit to face whatever comes in our days. And Father, would you help each of us to be faithful and true as we run our race that we could say and a pastor could say over us at the very end, they were faithful and true and they finished well and they finished the race and they were faithful to the end and now they're going to receive the
the crown of righteousness that you have promised to them. Father, may we each be those people that you are calling us to be. May we be the faithful and true witnesses that you are equipping us to be. May we be the faithful and true witnesses that this world needs us to be for you. And Father, may you get more and more glory as more and more people turn and trust in you because of these faithful and true witnesses who are here today. Father, we ask that you would always be present in this church. Lord, that you would never allow us to meet for a single thing without uh, asking for you to be here. We are nothing, and we want you in everything. And so, Father, we proclaim as a church today that we are dependent on you, and we desire it to be that way because we are your church. We are your people, and we are dependent upon you, and we are looking forward to seeing you face to face one day. Father, thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for the vastness and the depths of your love. May we each continue to grow into that each new day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive this benediction again from the Lord today. To the church in Connellsville, you who have been called by God to be his own holy people, he made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did all people everywhere who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. You are dismissed.